thank you for coming here today. You're either very bored or you owe some teacher something, but uh, I'll try not to bore you. Actually, about two months ago, Angus and Yanni came to me and said, would, uh, would you, Mrs. Sprague, uh, we're studying something called agape latte, and would you, you know, it's about talking about whatever. He said something kind of nebulous, and I said, I, of course, I said yes. And then I YouTubed it and saw what it was about a little bit. And uh, so basically, I'm supposed to talk about a theme. I chose a theme. And uh, I, I, by the way, I do not have a speech here, but I kind of extempore, ex whatever that word is, extemporously tell stories. So this is just to make sure my stories follow a loose theme, which is basically my life kind of culminating with McQuaid and the Jesuits and influences that have affected me through those times. Actually, we got to go back in time a little bit to uh, where my first influence started. I was a Catholic, born Catholic. I didn't know, you know, I had no choice. I was a Catholic, public school Catholic to be specific. Now, what does that mean? That means sign of the cross is no problem for us, uh, our Father. But other than that, we mouth the words, kind of time it when you kneel and sit. My dad brought me to Mass on Sundays, as he did my sister. So, you know, before I knew it, I was a Catholic. And I had no choice in the matter, but I was a Catholic. Kind of like my son Brian is a Cleveland Browns fan. He had no choice, doesn't know. But when he was born, Cleveland Brown pajamas, a Cleveland Brown clock, a Cleveland Brown calendar, and now he's a Browns fan, and he's not happy. Um, I saw my public school Catholic suit. Every Tuesday afternoon, we got out of school, two by two, marched three quarters of a mile down uh, Valley Drive in Syracuse, where I was, I was a first grader, went into Lourdes Church, and as soon as I walked in, I knew the nuns did not like us. We were the public school Catholics, and I was in first grade, and for some reason, they expected me to know how to spell my last name. Are you kidding me? There's silent letters in it and everything. But anyways, it was a bit. And these were not sound of music, uh, you know, the hills are alive kind of nuns. These were scary humans. Um, and luckily, I couldn't wait for that 45 minutes to be over and get back to John Van Dyne Public School where I could just write Tom on my paper and they didn't care about my last name. Um, so I'm going to fast forward right now uh, to... Freshman, sophomore year in college, I went to Ithaca College to save money, uh, live with my grandfather. Uh, and this, this is where the first influence of first, before I, I came to McQuaid, I even knew about a man for others, seeing God in everything. Uh, I was influenced by this man, William Arthur Sprague. He's about this big. Our size comes from my mom's side. But he had big hands, my, my hand, these are Pop's hands, but just put them on a guy about this big. He's not much bigger than that statue of Loyola out the, outside, just a little heavier. Um, but Pop, William Arthur Sprague, uh, he read three newspapers every morning from different cities, September 12th to uh, 1900 is when he was born. And uh, he self-taught, he did a correspondence school, he got an accounting degree from LaSalle through the mail. Can you imagine this, 1930s and 40s? Uh, he kept the books uh, for New York State Electric and Gas. He volunteered for everything, kept the books for Maclean Conception Church, uh, ran for mayor in 68, was beat by just a three or 400 votes, we didn't care because his friend was the mayor. He knew everybody, volunteered for everything, helped the elderly, picked them up, took them to where the, of course he was elderly. Um, but uh, Pop it influenced, uh, influenced me a lot. Um, oh, cigars. I'd see him when he shaved around his cigar in the morning. Now, he didn't always light it, but he shaved around it. At night, when I, uh, after studying, I was watching TV or something, he'd sit up at 2 o'clock reading. And I mean, I'd known my, this man all my life, but I never was with the creature in his own environs. So I didn't realize, you know, like when he slept, his cigar was always in his mouth. It wasn't lit. He would just chew it. It got shorter. But he would snore, and I'd see it, and then it would go out of sight. And then when they'd come back up, and I'd be there. It took me a couple of weeks before I wasn't, like, you know, ready to dial 911 or something. But um, Pop had a friend, uh, Reverend Cunningham, black uh, pastor of the A&E Church. And th this kind of influenced me as well back then. This is, uh, you know, late, this was 1970, 71. 
But he, he trusted my grandfather. Uh, they were close friends, obviously, because I don't think you go around the cities find too many uh, white men who keep the books for the A&E uh, Black Baptist Church. Uh, but that's how much uh, this man trust, uh, trusted my grandfather. Um, he was truly a man for others. Also, you, you were familiar with homeless, obviously. But back then, if you go to any town and you go outside of town and you're near the railroad tracks, back then, the, the word was hobos. Okay? A cross between homeless people and gypsies. They had their own culture. They still do, by the way. Uh, they're, uh, they, they, you know, they had their own code. I don't know if they found Pop or Pop found them, but they would, there were three or four of them would come regular to um, Pop's house down, downtown Ithaca, well, off the main street. I could always tell him it was a hobo because the doorbell would ring, and then we had a long hallway down to the porch, and there's nobody ever there because they would ring and then hide. And the reason they were hiding was because my step grandmother, Mary, was not happy with them. They would, she would kick them off the porch. But they came to see William Arthur. He knew them all by name, knew their background. Uh, he would come out. I saw him do it countless times. They didn't come every day. Um, some of them were from the south. It was kind of seasonal. In the summer, they'd be here. Uh, so Pop would go out, give him two or three bucks, close the door behind him. I didn't always say, but he always talked to them. Always was lecture, some kind of lecture they were hearing. But they, they didn't just get the money run. They called him Mr. Arthur. So Mary, and by the way, I should real quick, my grand, my, my uh, grandmother Monica Mullins, uh, she died of cancer when she was just fifty, and my uh, grandfather went to the hospital, pop every day just to roll her over so, so she would not get bed sores. So six or seven years later, he remarried. Um, he was uh, 60, she was 45, Mary Hastings, just to throw her in, uh, into the story because I loved her as well. But she was a spitfire, and she could not stand these hobos. Art, you know they're just going to take you two or three bucks, they're going to go buy cheap whiskey, they're going to buy wine, which they did, and they're going to go down by the cattails, down by the railroad tracks, and they're going to drink. And he would, Pop had a way of it, uh, just kind of smiling and waiting for this person, whoever it would be, to get get through their little tirade so we could kind of give them the truth, let them know that whatever thing you just said was really not important. And it was maddening. But after she got done, and he would tell me this as well, he goes, you know, one day, one of these men is going to be down and out, and he's going to need those two bucks to get a sandwich, and maybe then he might remember one of the things I told him. So that's, that, of course, that would exasperate me because it's kind of hard to argue that. You know, so, but anyway, that, so that, that influenced me. Uh, uh, you know, I, I hadn't heard about the term man for others, but Pop was a man for others. And he was just kind of, of course, I thought I was cool. I was 20 years old, had my, 19, had my afro, hung out on campus at the weekends, parties. Monday through Friday was with, basically I was with a Yoda, with a cigar. Um, but Pop, he would just say cool things, like he would just look at me and go, Thomas, it takes all kinds of people to make night baseball. And I'm thinking, wow, that just sounded cool. I wasn't really sure what he meant. But today, 50, 60 years later, I know exactly what he meant. And this guy was born in 1900, and a group called Sly and the Family Stone made a song exactly like that, different strokes for different folks. But he, he just had a, a wherewithal uh, about understanding people. Boom. A couple years later, here I am at McQuaid. I didn't teach yet. I was just coaching. I met a man named Tom Seymour, Field named after him, Coach Seymour. He was like, I just went into another realm of another pop, another Yoda, because he was so wise. I remember the first football banquet. He actually, now I have not been formally trained by Ignatian. I didn't know Jesuits yet. I wasn't, you know, hadn't, I hadn't taught him McQuaid yet, but my first, well, I was influenced by this man who lived it. He, you know, he, he, I remember at our first football banquet, he looked out and says, I can see God in all people. I see it in your eyes. He's talking to the parents as you're so proud of your sons. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that made me think. That's a, that's a cool thing. 
I remember my first Aquinas game, assistant coach on the sideline. I didn't know Aquinas. I'm from Binghamton, Johnson City, Best all those big schools. I hadn't heard about the rivalry. I mean, uh, Coach Seymour told me about it. And, and obviously, with each year, I knew more and more. But the very first time was a September, October day. And we played at U of R because Aquinas, well, at that time, didn't have their field. And they, they just rented out the uh, Holler Stadium. But, so we played at U of R. We beat them seven to six. Actually, we beat them four years in a row, uh, twice seven to six. They're not happy. But I still remember a kid was from Aquinas running for a touchdown. It was over. He was like 50 yards, and little Bobby Broomfield ran down and tackled him on the four. And, of course, they didn't pass. They didn't kick. They tried to smash it in four times. We held them. We beat them seven to six. But I remember the game is over, and I see all these people across the new VAR just flying across the field, guys, girls, adults, kids, Hundreds of them holding this big gold trophy as they came across. I'm going, holy cow, this is, this is really cool. So then I started learning more about that Aquinas uh, rivalry. Um, the Jesuits, okay? So now I'm finally got, I finally got hired by the home camp. So the Jesuits hired me, married me, baptized my kids, paid for my master's. And Father Fisher, who some of you may remember, he passed not long ago. He was our president, then became the chancellor. My sister Lizzie called me about 10, Liz Casey, her son Colin went here a little while ago. One of my sisters, she calls me, I'm doing a paint job on Sunday after Thanksgiving. She goes, Tom, my father, by the way, had uh, Alzheimer's in the last throes of it. Pretty much di didn't really know where he was. He was he, he was really really bad. He was in the Episcopal home down the road, and uh, we had heard that he'd probably had about two three months to live. So I get a call from my sister Lizzie, Tom. Dad took a turn for the worse. Do you think you could find somebody to uh, get do last rites? And I said, Oh God, Liz, I thought he had two months to live. He said, Well, something something went wrong. I said, Okay, well. So it was Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday, there was nobody around. So I get in my car, I drive into McQuaid. I didn't have my, I didn't have my school keys on me. So luckily there was a couple of cars, I wish I could remember who. Somebody came out of the office and I got in the door. And at that time we had phones. I was able to get to one of the wall phones in one of the rooms. And the Jesuits had like a, you know, they lived right here. By the way, they, you're saying their ghosts are among us right now. This was the residence where they lived. I can give you a name. Matter of fact, Ace Lacombe sitting right over there by you, Mayo. But anyways, um, I I looked in like you know like three three digit numbers. I saw there's Father Fisher because I, I just could tell there's nobody. Everybody's away in New York or gone. So I dialed the three numbers. Two rings. Doesn't he pick it up? And he goes, "Hello." I says, "I says, Father, hi. This is Tom Sprague. Hello, Thomas." I said, listen, and then as I started to talk, I realized how desperate this was, how it sounded, and also was the, the reality was hitting me. I go, Father, listen, my, my father is dying, and we don't have anybody to do last rites. I, I, can you help me? He said, well, Thomas, do you have your car? I said, yeah, Father, I got my car. He said, well, I got to go to a party. That's Thanksgiving, or somebody's pick him up to take him, or uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Somebody's going to have him over on su this is Sunday. He goes, but swing your car around back to residence, and I'll be down in a minute. So I pulled back, pulled back here. Sure enough, he came down with his little box of, you know, last right tools, and then uh, <laughs> his vestments, his robe, he had everything. Gets in the car, and we drive up Elman down Mount Hope to the home. And I went in, and there was my dad. Um, you know, just kind of ragged breathing. And I, of course, obviously, I don't think too many people have experienced, experience, I sure have never been around extreme unction or last rites. Uh, so the father got his, all of the oils and everything out, and I just stood there, watched my dad and Father Fisher next to me, you know, proceeded to do last rites. And, you know, so got back in the car, drove him, went to his party. <laughs> See you Monday, Thomas. Thanks, Father. So, I actually didn't even tell my own. Uh, I, well, I told my sisters that I did this, but it was an experience I won't forget. And another bond that I have with the Jesuits, obviously, the effect they had. Okay, then um, 
I'm a little not lighter. Now I'm in here teaching all you guys uh, for a long time. This is all, you know, we're talking 30, 40 years. And um, then I started formally uh, going to Kairos, hearing about, you know, you know, seeing God in all things. That, that stuck with me. That really did. Because I, 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 I could see that. I, 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 I am one of those guys that goes, I've, I've been in the Rockies. I've been in the Thousand Islands, the Appalachians, the ocean, uh, you know, Grand Canyon. And, and you know, I, I, I get it. It's erosion. You know, it, it's the solar system. It's, it, it's time. It's evolution. I understand that. But why? Why is, is my breath being taken away? Why to, almost to tears when you see a sunset? You, there, there's a design. And I started realizing, you know, how in the woods, just, of course, if you get your heads out of your iPhones once in a while, maybe do something like this and just put everything away. Don't even talk. Just listen. Just hear it all. It's just, it's just amazing, amazing to me. And I, I started to get that. Um, I would, um, matter of fact, uh, just the other day, seven day. I'm, of course, I'm running around chucking my head off with uh, in the hallways, and two or three times I passed Marcy Nesbitt. Now she's got one of Colleen's beautiful babies. I think it was Thomas, and that per- and I go oh, bring him back memories, Marcy. She goes, she goes, Tom, I could I could hold this baby all day long. So I'm no kidding. I said, how about the way they smell? They're beautiful. I mean, there's nothing like me. Some of you guys may have done it, but most of you are going to do it sometime. And you're going to look in that baby's eyes, and they're going to just touch you, and they're going to look at your soul and go, "Oh my God!" I'm like, it's just so beautiful. And you see God in all things. Oh yeah, I, I got, I, I got it. Respiratory, circulatory system, calc. You want to t- 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 test me on cognitive development, synapses, neurons? Oh yeah, that's all there. Oh, all the physiology. Endocrine system, yep, that's, that's the baby. That's the biological explanation, really. Anybody who just had, when you become a father, maybe it's already had when your little sister, you see that baby touch you, or you, it is just, it's all by design, it's beautiful. Seeing God in all things, and the, going to Kairos and being here with the Jesuits, I mean, I, I did it on my own a little bit always, but, you know, I, I, you guys are lucky to be aware of it. Maybe should be more aware of it. Um, oh yeah, unsolicited prayer. At least you guys are often told, you know, let's say a prayer for this or that, or remembering your prayers. And oh yeah, how many times is that? Well, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll pray for you. Oh, really? Did did you actually pray? I can just, re- and I'll tell you, uh, I just want one example. I'm going to go back a little bit, just to be aware of what's going on. I can still remember. Now this is I was 20 years old, senior. As you know, some of you know I played sports at Ithaca, and I still remember this. I'm on the sideline. It was my senior year, home game. Now, Ithaca College's football field's up on South Hill, Cornell's over on East Hill, but when you're on the field, you can look down, look on Cayuga Lake. It's a national anthem. I was one of those athletes that got nervous before a game. Some, I just envied the guys who just cocky, I'll go out there. I just wasn't like that. I mean, I was a good athlete and everything, but I was so nervous. Some of you guys may experience this, where you're kind of almost weak. My, my, until I got running, until I got the first hit, even in basketball, same thing, until I got a sweat going. I, I was just so almost de- debilitating. But I remember that feeling, national anthem. I got my helmet. I'm on the, I'm on the ends, on the, I'm on the kickoff coverage team. I'm one of the ends, so I'm going to go out there in the next few seconds. And I remember that, that feeling. I got the national anthem playing. It's sunny, golden leaves, breeze on my face. I'm looking out over Cayuga Lake where it takes a bend by Sheldrake Point, and it just occurred to me. I, I still remember it. I just said, I just, it was an impromptu prayer. It wasn't solicited. Nobody told me to do it. As bad as I felt, or as nervous and scared as I was, I said, God, thank you. I remember just looking at the anthem. I just drowned. I just said, God, thank you for letting me be here at this time, at this moment in my life. Because I am alive. I feel it in my stomach. I'm scared as hell. Don't get me wrong. But how few people get to have this feeling? And I just, I remember that one time. I still remember it. I'm talking about it. But, uh, um, so right there, then and not, then that moment, I took myself out, uh, and uh, so I just thought I'd throw that in. It's it kind of, kind of in the realm of this. Um, uh, Jesus carried his own cross to his death, 
And that later on became a metaphor. You know, you, you have, we all bear a cross, you know, cross, the metaphor of being trials and tribulations of life, all the things, the work, things that go wrong, things that, and every, we all bear one, some bigger than others. Um, I remember talking to Adam Baber once, and he's, somehow we got around the to topic of, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, one of my pet peeves, Adam, is people who bear their styrofoam cross as if it were iron. I mean, that's, you know, there's always somebody in worse trouble than you. Wouldn't it be more noble to carry your iron cross as if it were styrofoam? If you, it, 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 it's, Stop thinking of yourself first. Stop thinking about yourself first. Bear your cross as if it were styrofoam. When you meet somebody, you guys all pretty much know each other around here. Because people always say, you know, and I've heard this said about me, uh, he won't say shite if he had a mouthful of it. I never thought that was a negative thing. It's sort of a negative connotation. Like, I, I, I just never, oh, Mr. Sprague, is there any, any teachers you don't like? Any enemies? No. Now, are there teachers I might like more, invite to my birthday party, and some not? Of course. But I'm just telling you, because I, I do hear a lot of negativity in the halls. Not, a lot of it's just fun, and I understand that. But believe me, if you look at somebody and try to find something good before you find something bad, find something good. Say something good about that person. Now, I'm not going to be corny right now and say, point to the person next to you and say something good, because if you actually did do that, you tend to look at things all differently. Look at somebody first and look for the good in them. And don't think of yourself first. If those two things, I, I, it's, I, I've, 44 years in McQuaid, I don't, I, somehow I wash out bad memories. I just don't have any. I, I, obviously there were, but everything just seems to be, it's all good. And I think, I think that philosophy has always helped me. Um, and uh, I'll, as Corn said, I'll get you out of here on this. Um, and another thing, these, these are things guys say, which is, you know, which is kind of interesting, especially when they know somebody's about to go out to pasture, like myself. Um, you know, what, what I hear this even from faculty members, even from my, my, my faculty peers here, you know, the good old days. Was it better back then, man, in the 70s and 80s? Or is it better now? Uh, you know, how was it like? It, it was different. There's no question it was different. And uh, I have memories. Obviously, lots of memories and a lot of great people. Anybody who's gone to Kairos with me knows when I do my life graph speech, I play the song, one of my favorites uh, by the Beatles, In My Life, Rubber Soul Album. And some of the words, you know, some, are, some of the words go, you know, there are places I remember and there are people I know and some are dead and some are living. Um, all these memories have their meanings. And so I do... I, I will never forget those. But as far as better then than now, to say it was better, well, I, I, sh I sure the hell was a horrible teacher back then, not that I'm that great now, but, but if somebody, if, if, and I'm going to say it right now, if somebody said or asked as they have then and now, to say that, that back then I was more bonded with them or enjoyed it more or loved it more, or had better memories, that would be so not disrespectful for underestimating and diminishing the beautiful, beautiful friendships that I have now, that I wouldn't trade for a minute. As a matter of fact, these last 10, 15 years, I couldn't, I have never been more happy. I can't wait to come. I love faculty meetings. How do you like that? Do you watch these people? I've told people that. You think I'm kidding too? I, and I, I do kindly because I, I, oh, I used to piss Mr. Countryman off horribly. But I said, yeah, I get, because that's where all my friends are. And, but I, I, I actually, truth be told, I, I kind of mean it. Um, because, uh, I like that song said, though these memories have their meanings, but in my life, I love you more. So, McQuaid right now, today, and my friends and faculty here, who I will miss, 
You guys are lucky. Okay, stop focusing on the freaking schedule. It may suck and all the things. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a very good place. I've been here 44 years, I'm not stupid. Okay, I, I, I could have left. I had a couple opportunities, didn't. Why would I? I wish I could do 44 more. Um, thank you.